Hey friends, Dr. Andy Lane Buncher, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today and we're going to continue with our series on how to make decisions in just a moment. Before we get to that, of course, as always, we want to remind you of the resources we have free and available for you at randylanebunch.org. Of course, that is the Connecting Point Communications website and under the media link in the menu, you will find a plethora of resources free and available for you. Our blog, our podcast, past editions of our television broadcast, our YouTube channel is there, and we would love it if you would go there, subscribe, like, and comment. That would be a great blessing and help to us. Also, of course, we want to hear from you. If you would email us uh, with your testimonies, your prayer requests, your praise reports, particularly if God has somehow touched you through the viewing of this broadcast, we would really love to hear from you. So please email us at info at connectingpc.org. Well, as I said, we're going to continue with our series on how to make decisions and really to get the most out of what you're going to hear today, it would probably be a good idea for you to go back on our YouTube channel and watch the last couple of weeks as we've begun on this subject of how to make decisions. I don't know any sincere disciple of Christ who doesn't want to make the right decision in their life, follow God's will for their lives. The question is, how do we do it? How do we make the right decision? And so we've been using as our main text, James chapter 1, and we've been looking at verses 2 through 8. For time's sake, we're going to cut that down a little bit today and look at verses 5 through 8 of James chapter 1. And here James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, like I said, whenever we're asking God for wisdom, I think it kind of begs the question, what's wisdom? And a lot of times people have heard different uh, definitions. We've heard kind of the textbook definition many of us in church grew up with. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. And that's true, but it kind of leaves me dry. I still feel like I don't quite know what wisdom is after heard, hearing a definition like that. So in seeking God and asking him, what is wisdom? What, how, how could I concisely define wisdom for those whom I teach? He said it to me this way. He said, Randy, wisdom is God's what to do. You know, we all come to that fork, uh, fork in the road in life. You know, we don't know, should I go this way or that way? Should I marry this individual or that individual? Should I go to this school or that school? Take this job or that job? It's a cry for wisdom. And anytime we have a cry for wisdom, we can ask of God and he'll give us his wisdom liberally and without reproach. He'll give us his what to do. Like I like to say, God's got a what to do for you. But in addition to his what to do, it's also his when to and his how-to. In fact, the Bible in the book of Exodus speaks of two men, Aholiab and Bezalel. They were two men whom God gave wisdom to know how to craft the articles in the tabernacle. Moses was commissioned with building the thing, but he didn't have the skill to do it, especially the articles and some of the finer instruments in the tabernacle. So God gave the wisdom to a couple of men and some other artisans to enable them to know how to oversee that project and how to do it. And sometimes you just have a knowledge in how to do something. You just know how to do it. It's a wisdom. And so likewise, God will give you wisdom to uh, have the know-how necessary to accomplish whatever it is he's called you to do it. You'll just get a clever idea and you say, you know, I think this will work. Well, what is that? It's God's wisdom. It's his what to do. It's his how to. And also very important, we talked about timing being such a crucial element. It's his when to. And so we made this statement, and I think it's so important. Decisions determine direction, and direction determines destiny. One of the great examples of that in the New Testament is in the book of Acts. And we looked at this on a couple of occasions, and so we're just going to kind of look at it quickly again. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And here in the church at Antioch, we kind of get insight into a staff prayer meeting. And here we see in verse 1 of Acts chapter 13, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to be Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Let's go ahead and read verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them, they sent them away. So here's God giving them his what to do, his wisdom. How did they get this wisdom? They got this wisdom in a time of prayer, in seeking God. As we've said before, if you want to hear from God, you've got to put yourself in an environment where you can hear his voice. And if you're always caught up with the busyness of life and paying more attention to the things of this natural world than you are spiritual things, you're not putting yourself in a position 
to where you can hear from God. You know, if you were shouting uh, to me and trying to give me a message across maybe a crowded parking lot and I couldn't hear you, the natural thing for me to do would be to get closer because between you and me is a lot of noise that's cluttering up the atmosphere. This cacophony of noise that we have in the world today is oftentimes confusing us not enabling us to hear the voice of God. So we need to get quiet and we need to get closer to God. And one of the ways we can do that is by spending time as they did, ministering to the Lord, waiting on God. But it was in that environment of waiting on God that direction came. And this direction determined, or rather this, uh, this decision they made determined the direction that they received from God. And that was to go into the world, Paul and Barnabas, and uh, you know, uh, fulfill their apostolic calling. They made a decision to wait on God, which provided direction, and it certainly determined not only Paul and Barnabas' destiny, but the destiny of many of us who have been impacted by their life and their ministry. So if we're going to wait on the Lord, and if we're going to minister to Him, what do we do in that time of waiting on God? I like to make things as practical as possible. So Randy, how do I wait on God? What does that mean? Well, another translation says, as they worshiped the Lord and fasted. You know, there's something about praise and worship that brings us into a sense of God's presence. We don't move into the presence of God geographically like they did in the Old Covenant, going from the outer court to the inner court. Rather, the Bible said, we have this glory in earthen vessels. Our movement is not so much geographical as it is spiritual. Uh, getting our mind on Him, moving out of the natural carnal concerns of this physical life, and focusing on God, worshiping Him, being mindful of Him, magnifying Him, and we're suddenly conscious of His presence. God inhabits the presence, praises of His people, and as we praise and worship and minister to the Lord, we begin to sense His presence, and it's easier to hear His voice. But when I'm in times of waiting on God, there's several ways I do it. I love to pray in the Spirit. Uh, the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, that when we pray in the Spirit, when we pray in another tongue, we speak mysteries, divine secrets, things that we don't know from the natural standpoint. God will enable us to pray out His will, plan, and purpose as we pray in the Holy Spirit. But there's a couple of very practical things I like to pray as well. I love the prayers of Paul, as many of you know. And Colossians 1, 9 through 11 is one of my favorite. It says this, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. We could read on, but I think this gives us a general impression of what to pray. We're to pray that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. Remember, it's not just getting the what, it's the when and the how. And getting the wisdom of God along with a general sense of his direction for our lives is so crucial to stepping into the right decision to determine the right direction that we might wind up in the right destination. Today, I want to focus a little bit more though on some of the practical ways in which God actually speaks to our hearts. What does it sound like when God speaks? I think sometimes maybe it's unfortunate that we use that language of God speaking to us because it leaves the impression that we're looking for a phys physical, audible kind of voice. And that's not what we're looking for. Uh, we are spirit beings and God is a spirit. In fact, the Bible said in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 17, he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So God is going to communicate to us, not necessarily from his mind to our mind, but from his spirit to our spirit. In fact, notice this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And then go down a couple of verses below that. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So God's going to lead us by his Spirit. But what does that like? How does he do that? Well, it says he bears witness with our spirit. If I were to ask you, how do you know you're a child of God? You might say, well, the Bible tells me so, and I would certainly accept that. But if I were to say, yeah, but outside the Bible, how do you know you're a child of God? You might say, well, I don't, I don't know. I just know that I know. You might say it this way. I have a witness inside my own heart. And you know you would be exactly right. The Bible said he that's born of God has the witness in himself. And God witnesses with our spirit. It's not an intellectual thing. It's not a rational reasoning thing. It's more of an intuitive thing, a knowing down on the inside. And the Bible speaks again and again of this idea of the spirit of God speaking to our spirits, that it's in our spirits, as it were, that we hear the voice of God. In Proverbs 20, 27, we read this. 
The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. So it's in our spirits that we look to discern and ascertain the will of God. We're not talking about looking inside our true self. We're talking about looking inside ourselves because that's where the spirit of God dwells. He lives in us. We're one spirit together with him. And when he speaks to us, it's going to be spirit to spirit. Or as another verse says, he speaks deep calls to deep. And oftentimes that's exactly what it's like. God stirs us in our spirit. We have an impression, a sense, a witness in our heart of which way God is leading us because the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the heart or the belly as the old King James says. We look down on the inside because God illumines us through our spirits and then our understanding catches up with our heart. I love this verse, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. And then there's a beautiful promise in Psalm 18 verse 28 that goes beautifully right along with this. It says, for you will light my lamp, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Well, how's he going to do that? In and through our spirits by his spirit bearing witness with our own hearts. Again, remember what we said before, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So number one, we call it the inward witness. God leads us by an intuitive witness in our own spirit, his spirit simply bearing witness with our heart that this is what he would have us to do. Every major decision in life I have ever made has come by this inward witness. Yes, I have at times received supernatural confirmation, and we'll probably talk about that next week, how God will sometimes solidify his direction to our life through something a little bit more supernatural, but usually only under certain conditions. But God's going to lead us and guide us through what we call the inward witness. Fortunately, there's other ways in which we can describe this inward witness that I think will help us to also recognize it so we can identify it when God is speaking to us. Sometimes we'll call that inward witness the peace of God. Look with me, if you will, in the book of Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 15, Colossians 3, 15. And here it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. In other words, let peace rule. Now, that word rule is an ancient word that literally means to be the umpire. Let peace call the shots. You know what? Let me, let me read this to you uh, out of the Amplified Translation. I didn't intend to do this, so it'll take me a moment to get there, but let me read this to you out of the Amplified Translation. I think it'll bless you. It says this, And let the peace, soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule, Act as umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. I love that. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let it continually serve as the umpire, determining your decisions and thus determining your direction, enabling you to wind up in the right destination. So we have the inward witness. We have the peace of God. And you know, I, I've told people for years, I will not forfeit my peace for anybody. You know, there have been times where in my life as a minister and as a believer, I would see people jumping on certain theological bandwagons or following a particular uh, course of direction or, you know, something real popular maybe is happening in the church. It seems like everybody and their brother is running to it. But maybe something in my heart just had a reservation. I just didn't have peace with it. And there have been many times that I have missed a lot of chaos, a lot of drama, and a lot of turmoil simply because instead of following the crowd, I followed the cloud as it were. I followed the witness of the Spirit in my own heart. You know, the children of Israel would follow the cloud uh, through the wilderness to wind up at the promised land, and now that glory is in our own hearts, and so we can follow the inward witness of the Spirit, follow the peace of God in our hearts. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't forfeit my peace for anybody. There have been a couple of times in life where I knew not to do something. I had no peace whatsoever in making a given decision, but just hard-headedly, I decided, no, I'm going to do it. And it's never, ever been something that I've done without it costing me dearly. So friend, I want to encourage you, learn from someone who's made the wrong decision a time or two. Always learn to follow peace. You'll never go wrong if you let peace be the umpire. Third and finally, and we've talked about this before, some of you might remember us talking about this, but we said, learn to follow your seamer. And you might be thinking, what in the world are you talking about? What is a seamer? Well, I'm going to show you exactly what a seamer is. Uh, go with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. 
Now we know that Luke wrote his beautiful gospel that bears his name. And in addition to that, he was also the author of the book of Acts. In fact, many scholars simply call it Luke Acts. It's like one volume with two parts split right down the middle. The first part of it is about Jesus's earthly ministry. The second part of it is about Jesus's ministry through the church in the earth as his spirit empowers us to do his works. But I want you to notice why Luke, the physician, uh, was led and how he was led to write the gospel that he wrote. Notice what he says here in verse 3 of Luke 1. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. My goodness, here Luke is writing this beautiful gospel account that's included in the canon of Scripture along with the book of Acts. And how did he come to the conclusion he should do this? It seemed good. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I knew that this was in Luke's language particularly, but I noticed that also there were times in the Old Testament, and Jesus even quoted some of those times, where he said that God did something because it, seemly, it se uh, simply seemed good in his eyes to do it. So we need to learn to follow our seamer. Why did you do that? I don't know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. It just seemed good as I was thinking about it to go in that particular direction. You're learning to follow peace. You're following the inward witness. You're learning to follow your seamer. Uh, go with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, and we're going to look at another place where you, uh, Luke uses this same language. Again, a very auspicious occasion. This is what is known as the Council of Jerusalem. An enormous doctrinal decision was being determined. Should the Gentiles have to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses, or should they just trust in the grace of God through faith to be justified? And of course, we know that in the Council of Jerusalem, thank God, they chose wisely. They said, no, the Gentiles don't need to be encumbered with all these laws we ourselves could not ever follow, nor our forefathers. But I want you to notice how they came to the conclusion. They write a letter to the Gentile churches, and I want you to hear the language that they use. Beginning with verse 22 in Acts 15, listen to how they word it. It says, Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also called, named Barsabbas, uh, Bar and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled together with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you may abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. You know, when they were making these decisions, they did not have an angel sky writing, you know, in the sky, this is what you should do. They didn't have a hand that wrote on the wall, uh, you know, the text of what they should do. They didn't have any guidelines drop out of heaven. They just had to do what seemed right according to their knowledge of the scriptures and the witness of the Spirit. They simply did what seemed right through the Holy Spirit and with their own hearts and they were following the will of God. And then if you drop down to verses 31, we'll see this language again. It says, when they had read it, this is talking about the Gentile churches reading this letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So here you have, on several occasions, men doing what simply seemed good to them. They're not just doing whatever they want in their own eyes. They're not just following their own counsel. They're following the witness of the Spirit. They're following the peace of God. But in the end of things, friend, they just simply did it because it seemed good. It seemed like the right thing to do. That's how the apostles made that decision. 
to put no burden on the Gentiles simply other than to trust in Christ and abstain from immorality and these necessary things, but they basically gave them that decision because it simply seemed good. Same reason wrote, uh, Luke wrote his gospel. It seemed good. And there have been many a time, friend, where I just had it in my heart to do something because it simply seemed good. Did God tell you to do it, Brother Randy? Well, in a sense, I certainly had no alarm or witness not to do it. And every time I would think about it, it just seemed good. Now, there have been times where I've had people try to put demands on me and it did not seem good. I did not have peace with it. I didn't have a witness to do that. You know, so much of the time, friends, in life, People will try to determine your course for you. I just shared the other day in our daily devotional that if you're being led by pressure or if you're being manipulated or if you're being uh, driven by other people's agenda or by fear or by finances, if you're being driven by any of those things, you're not being led by the Spirit of God. God's ways are always the ways of peace. If you think about the beautiful Psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness beside, you know, green pastures. It's all these images of peace and tranquility. That's the way of God. He will always lead you in the way of peace. Peace is to call the shots. It's to be the umpire in your life. And like I said, every time I've stepped away from peace to try to accommodate somebody who wanted me to fulfill their agenda or do something that really I did not have peace with, it's always cost me. And, and let me tell you, friend, you've heard me say it many times before on this broadcast, I'm sure. God loves you and everyone else has a wonderful plan for your life. You have to make sure that you're not following the dictates of other people or their agenda for your life. You've got a call upon your life and you're going to have plenty uh, of things to do. You're going to have plenty on your plate just doing what God's called you to do, not trying to be a people pleaser and do everything else that others want you to do. Be faithful to God. Follow his witness in your spirit by his spirit. Follow the peace of God and do what seems good and you will find the will of God for your life. Now, in making these decisions, there are times where God will supply a little something more supernatural, a little bit more demonstrative. And I have found in my life that when God has done that, he's done that because he knows that difficult sailing is coming up. There's going to be some rough waters I'm going to be facing, tough sailings coming my way, and so I need something a little more demonstrative to hold me steady. But friend, we have no scriptures that promise us that we'll have a dream or a vision or some other kind of demonstrative direction. God promises to direct us and lead us by his spirit. Jesus said he would lead us and guide us into all truth. He would show us things to come. He will bear witness with our spirit, and that's what we can count on. If God decides you need anything more than that, he will give that to you. But if he doesn't, take the direction he's given you. Follow the witness of the Spirit. Do what seems right. Follow the peace of God. And as you do so, you'll make the right decisions. You'll be going in the right direction and you'll wind up at the right destination. You know, God is merciful. We've all missed it from time to time. Uh, I remember years ago, I was trying to find a church to attend. I was attending one particular church in the, uh, uh, in the Midwest and it just didn't seem to... Uh, be satisfying to me. I didn't feel like I was being fed. It was just something that, I don't know, it just, it just didn't, it didn't feed me. And so I thought, I'm going to try some other churches out. And so we went to another church that some friends of ours were attending and it just didn't seem right. Again, it didn't fit. It just didn't feel uh, like the church I should be going to. It just didn't seem right. And I just didn't have peace. Even though my friends were satisfied there, I wasn't. And I'm not following them. I'm following God. So we tried some other place and you know, we just weren't settled. We just did not have in our heart peace as to what our church was to be. Well, sure enough, sometime later, I was in a meeting in another part of the country and the pastor from the church that I had left initially was there. And they brought him up on the platform to greet the people and to speak to everyone for just a moment. And the moment he got behind the pulpit, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, that's your pastor. And I thought, no, Lord, I, I, I just left that church because I didn't feel I was being fed. But God would not give me any further direction. I knew in my heart it just seemed right that I needed to go back to that initial church. I didn't feel like I was really getting fed a lot, but for some reason I knew God wanted us to be there. 
Well, long story short, one of my sons got filled with the Holy Spirit there. God blessed us in various ways because we obeyed him. And in the process of time, God opened up another door, another church in the community that he did lead us to go to. But had we been caught up in one of those other churches and got committed in one of them, we would not have been free then to follow the direction that came to us a little bit later. See, God knows the what, the why, the where, and the when, and you and I do not. And so sometimes, even if we don't understand, remember what we said, trust in the Lord uh, with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And most of the time, I would have told people, listen, if you're not being fed, go where you're being fed. That's That would be the wisdom of God, generally speaking. And normally that's what I would have done. But I just knew the Spirit of God was impressing upon my heart. I had the witness of the Spirit to go back to that church. And when we did, God blessed us. And in the process of time, he led us out into another church where we fit like a glove. And from there, then God led us on in to the traveling ministry in another part of the nation. Uh, but God blessed us exceedingly because we followed the leading of the Spirit. Again, decisions determine direction and direction determines destiny. Make sure that you're following the will of God for your life and not someone else's will for your life because a lot of people will have an agenda they want you to serve on their behalf. Well, friends, we hope this was a blessing to you. I want to take a moment and ask you, have you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ? You know, of all the decisions you will ever make, there is not one that is more important or more paramount for your life, your joy, your future, your eternity than what you do with Jesus. Friend, it's not enough to say, I believe he's a good man. I believe he was a prophet. It's not even enough to believe that he's God and that he's the Messiah. You have to personally receive him as Lord and Savior yourself. You see, belief doesn't just mean, yeah, I believe God exists. It means a trust in and reliance upon. It means a faithfulness to. And so if you truly believe in Jesus in a biblical sense, you're going to put your faith and trust in him. Friend, he died for you to pay the penalty for your sins. And he wants you to put your faith and trust in him that he might be your savior and that he might direct your steps in this life so that you can have that abundant life he desires for you to have. Are you ready to surrender your life to him? Are you ready to receive him and put your trust and faith in him as Lord and Savior? If so, why don't you pray this simple prayer? Just say this, dear Jesus, I believe you died for me to pay the penalty for my sins. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my heart to you. I put my trust in you. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I really, really want to hear from you. Would you email me at info at connectingpc.org? I'd love to share some wonderful information with you. And also, again, we want to remind you of the website, randylanebunch.org. Under the media link, there will be a lot of resources there that can help to disciple you and mature you in the things of God. But perhaps you have a need in your body today. Maybe you need healing, a touch from heaven. I'm going to pray for you now. Get ready to receive from God. Father, I pray for my friends watching the broadcast today. Father, whoever is sick, whoever has a chronic condition, Father God, who is ever crippled, Father God, whoever maybe is suffering from the effects of COVID. Father, whatever the condition, we ask you to stretch forth your healing hand right now in the name of Jesus. Confirm your word. Heal the sick. Father God, we break the oppression of the enemy off the minds of those watching the broadcast now. We thank you for complete total deliverance and healing. We give you thanks and praise, Father God, for touching them, for healing them, for ministering life to them. We give you thanks and praise for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we love you. God bless you. We hope that you'll tune again next time for another edition of Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.